Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining your starting your week with us. I should say right here on Facebook and on YouTube, going to do our best to entertain and inspire for the next little while on tap today, a big old show, calorie density, food addiction, and her truth about weight loss. I'm so excited because the one and only Chef AJ will be on the exam room live with us today. Chef AJ, I'm so thrilled that you're here with us. I can't wait to talk to you. Oh, me too. I've always wanted to talk to you, Chuck. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And Dr. Neil Barnard is also kicking off the week with us here on the exam room as we get set for the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine. That starts this Thursday. But today he will be looking at an interesting new study about the risks facing doctors and nurses working on the front lines in the battle against COVID-19 and what that trickle down effect could mean for you and for me. Dr. Barnard, some very interesting findings I know that you have to talk about here today. And lessons for everybody. You bet, Chuck. And Indeed. And don't forget to send in your questions because we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a minute. Dr. Barnard here to prescribe his answers. So post your health and nutrition inquiries in the comments section, or you can tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room podcast. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Monday, August 3rd, 2020. The number of coronavirus cases in the U.S. now stands at more than 4.6 million after more than 110,000 new infections were reported over the weekend. Dr. Deborah Burks saying Sunday that the country is entering a new phase of the pandemic with extraordinarily widespread infections. But it does appear there are signs the spread is beginning to slow. However, the average number of cases each day still remains well over 60,000. The states with the highest rate of infection currently per capita? Florida, Mississippi, Nevada, Georgia, and Alabama. Nationwide, more than 1,200 people are dying on average from COVID-19 every day, and health experts say that number is likely to continue to rise in the coming weeks as it lags behind reported infections. In other news, a new study is giving us insight on just how different the Battle of the Bulge can be for men and women. Researchers in Canada say women who live alone are single, widowed, divorced, or separated are more likely to be obese. Conversely, men who lived alone and only have a small social network are not as likely to be carrying around extra weight. The study examined 28,000 adults between the ages of 45 and 85, and researchers suggest that the disparities can partly be chalked up to the different social expectations of the different sexes. And finally, it appears that America's sweet tooth is in fact as sweet as ever, but more people are being calorie conscious when they crush their cravings. Sales of food and drink that contain real sugar fell sharply between 2002 and 2018, while sales of products containing calorie-free sweeteners were booming, but not all of them, however. Americans were shying away from certain sugar substitutes such as aspartame and saccharin, those findings were published in the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Now, Dr. Barnard, potentially we're talking about a shift in the right direction here, but the jury is still out on a lot of these calorie-free sweeteners. We're seeing obesity rates continue to climb despite the popularity of these things. So really, how much do we know about them? The that I have seen suggests that the calorie-free sweeteners are reasonably safe. Um, however, they don't really seem to help, um, which is to say when a person's got a Coke habit and they're drinking or a Pepsi habit or a Dr. Pepper habit or whatever, they're drinking a couple of sodas a day. When they switch to the calorie free ones, we really don't see uh, impressive weight loss and we don't see reductions in diabetes and other things like that. Part of the reason is that diabetes isn't caused by drinking soda. That's um, a minor issue at most. Um, as we've talked about many times here, it has to do with insulin resistance. Uh, the other part, and a lot of us have been concerned, that even the calorie-free sodas maintain that expectation for sweet things, for sugary things, for overeating. And so they don't necessarily cause us to stop uh, bad eating habits in and of themselves. If anything, they might encourage them. So um, I suspect that although it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable thing, to get away from the caloric sweeteners, 
we got to do a whole lot more than that. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be talking more about health and weight loss with Chef AJ in just a little bit. Healthier habits for sure. But I understand that right now there's also new information today in the battle against COVID-19. And you wanted to talk about a new study on the risks that are facing the frontline healthcare workers and the trickle effect, the trickle down effect that those risks have on us. What exactly are we looking at with this study? Yeah, um, what you said is exactly right. There's There are new data on the frontline workers, but there's a huge lesson for everybody else. And let me just walk you through it. The question is masks and PPE in general. We think of them as protecting us. And so the people who need the protection the most are the people in the hospitals. So the question is, do they help? Uh, so there was a huge study. It was done in the US and also in the UK. 2 million participants, including almost 100,000 of them were frontline hospital workers. And the others were people working elsewhere, working in the community. And they tracked their symptoms with this smartphone app that's made by Zoe Global. Uh, it's a cool thing. Uh, going into the pandemic, people started using the app and they would track, did they have a fever, a cough, other symptoms, and they logged them in and then uh, in March and April, the researchers started crunching the numbers, seeing who was getting sick and, and who was not. And the first thing that they discovered was that the hospital workers were a whole lot more likely to test uh, positive for COVID-19, about more than threefold uh, more likely to do this. And so you say, well, of course, I mean, you're dealing with sick people, you're more likely to, to, to get sick, but if you're using your PPE, you should be, your, your risk shouldn't be any higher. It didn't turn out that way at all. There was increased susceptibility, even those people who felt they were using their PPE correctly. Now let's go a little bit more. Uh, we have talked about racial disparities here and they are real. Um, however, we, also, we, we see this in both black and white uh, participants in the research study. If you looked at the people in the white community, compare them to people white hospital workers. The hospital workers were much more likely to test positive. The same is true among the black participants uh, in the community compared to being in the hospital. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is we hear so much about wearing your mask and distancing and hygiene. Those are really important. They really are. and They're, they're as important as ever. It's not controversial. It's not debatable. You need personal protection. However, the people who use them the most carefully find that they fail. They fail a lot. So that means we've got to go further and figure out the other risk factors. And just a quick review, from the very beginning when the virus emerged in China, it was clear, as you see on this slide, the heavier you were, the more likely you were to get really sick. Then people with diabetes much more likely to die of this disease compared to people who didn't have diabetes. And among people with diabetes, if you were in poor control, high risk. If you had diabetes, but it was in good control, much lower risk. Uh, and, and the differences are fairly small between poor control and good control. In this study, it was just an A1C of 8%, 8.1, down to getting it down to 7.3%. Uh, you can do that with diet. So bottom line is, Yes, you want a mask. Absolutely. We want to be very careful about all these things. But if we, if that is all we are doing, we're really missing the boat. I agree. So the, the, it's certainly a lot that we can do. And it's interesting that you you bring up those figures because on Wednesday's show, uh, you and I are going to be speaking with Dr. Hanna Kaliova, who will be presenting findings on why obesity is so common with COVID-19 patients. So there's brand new research on that as well that we're going to be diving into. A lot of great points there, Dr. Barnard. But uh, let's quickly now pivot Let's open up the doctor's mailbag. We have a phenomenal question today from a woman by the name of Katrina, and she writes in, interesting one, I have hypothyroid Hashimoto's, and I've been told that it is best for me to consume meat. Do you have any recommendations? I do. Well, first of all, thank you for writing, and I'm sorry to hear that you got that diagnosis, but you are not alone. Many people have this. And Just a, a quick word about what this is. Um, your thyroid gland is at the base of your neck. It makes thyroid hormone to give you energy. And there are a lot of people who are low in thyroid hormone. And Hashimoto's thyroiditis is just 
a word um, named after Dr. Hashimoto, who in Japan many years ago identified that many people had an autoimmune reaction so that their thyroid was not cranking out thyroid hormone as well as it should. Um, researchers at the Adventist Health Study 2 did a fascinating study. They looked at diet patterns and who does best and who does worst. And your question, uh, is meat gonna be helpful for me? Uh, the short answer is no. The people who had the lowest risk of hypothyroidism were people following a completely plant-based diet. The people who did worse were meat eaters and worst of all, people who ate a lot of dairy. And the same is true for the other side of the coin. If you have hyperthyroidism, the vegans again do the best, but the meat eaters do the worst. Um, wh here's what we don't have. We don't have a good study taking people who have hypothyroidism, putting them on a plant-based diet versus a control group and seeing if the thyroid condition gets better or goes away. I would like to do that because we have many, many people who have been hypothyroid as, as, as you are with Hashimoto's condition who have gone on plant-based diets and they've done better. In fact, in your body in balance, my new book, I describe their experiences and it's heartening to see. We need more research, but in the meanwhile, I would steer clear of the meat. I would go on a plant-based diet, stay in touch with your doctor and see how you do. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We save them and we will try to get you an answer on an upcoming show. Dr. Barnard, appreciate your time, my friend. You bet. Thank you. Moving on. My next guest really needs no introduction, but we're going to give her one anyway, just because she's that cool. She's a critically acclaimed chef who is no stranger to plant-based eating. A matter of fact, she's been whipping up these masterpieces for years and years and years, and she is here today to spill the beans on her secrets for weight loss. I'm so excited to welcome Chef AJ to the exam room live. Chef AJ, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I've loved your show for so long. And vice versa, my dear. Now, let's start with your particular story because you have been fueled by plants for many, many years, but really you didn't kick it into next level vegan until what, 10 years ago, something like that? Absolutely. You know, I, I don't want to get into the controversial aspect of masks, but since we have to wear one in my county, this is what mine says. I love it so much. I love it so much. Vegan since 1977. Yeah. But healthy since 2003 and only slender for the last eight years. So I, I've had quite a journey because I think it's great that people are vegan for ethical reasons and environmental reasons and health reasons. But for people that wish to be at their ideal weight, it's not always a guarantee. And I did everything wrong. And my story is to tell people that there's a healthy way to do vegan and there's a not as healthy way to do vegan. Because as a vegan, I ended up 200 pounds with the beginning of colon cancer. So I obviously was not eating a very healthy diet for the first 26 years of being vegan. And that's an important message, especially right now, as we see interest in uh, plant-based eating going vegan at an all-time high. The trends are just through the roof. You can't even turn on the TV without seeing advertisements for plant-based products. But the thing is, a lot of them are, you know, what Dr. Barnard would refer to as start starter foods or transition foods. So how did you come across the idea of really getting to that next step and, and taking charge of your health? Yeah. Well, it was because I was bleeding internally. So I had, I had become vegan on September 1st, 1977, purely for ethical reasons. I was a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's great, you know, but I didn't know Dr. Barnard then that we didn't have an internet. He was around, but I didn't know him. If I had known, I might've done things differently. But people have to realize that French fries are vegan, potato chips are vegan, soda is vegan. And so instead of eating a whole food plant-based or plant-exclusive diet, like I do now, I was eating vegan junk food because there really wasn't very many options in the dining hall. I was at Penn. So I ate the chips. I ate the soda, you know, I, I don't, I just ate a bunch of crap. And that's how I got to be so heavy. And that would have been one thing to just be heavy for, you know, aesthetic reasons. But on January 1st, 2003, when I was almost 43 years old and had been vegan for 26 years, I, I broke up bleeding and I had the beginning of colon cancer. And that was a big wake up call because even though I was vegan, I wasn't healthy because I wasn't eating really any fiber. I wasn't eating fruits or vegetables or whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. I was eating candies, cakes, cookies, pies and ice creams. I was eating junk food. And so you can and now and the funny thing is, Chuck, is they didn't even have the products back then. I still managed to do it without 
without the day of cheese and the gardein meat and all the beyond and impossible burgers. We didn't even have plant milk in a box. I still was able to eat crap even before this stuff was invented. And now it's even easier to go down that path because the analogs are every bit as addictive as their non-vegan counterparts. People have to understand that processed food is addictive. It's readily available, easily affordable, socially acceptable, but it is addictive. There have been books about this, like The End of Overeating by Dr. David Kessler, the former head of the FDA, or Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us by the investigative journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Michael Moss, that sugar's addictive, fat's addictive, salt's addictive. And when you put them together and they're processing, layering, and loading that, that, that makes you have this bliss point in your brain, brain that creates this hyper palatable food, you can't eat just one, whether it's a vegan version or a non-vegan version. And while there is a certain segment of the population that can eat this crap and maybe not be addicted or be overweight, that's not most of us. Oh, tell me about it. T -t -t tell me about it. I am definitely in the majority with that one. Uh, do you think, though, that because the foods that you were eating when you first went vegan were so addictive, those high fat, salty foods, do you find that like maybe it was actually easier for you to find those foods because you were addicted? And as the saying goes, where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. I didn't even really know the concept of food addiction until I was almost 50. And I had to get this help outside the vegan world because with the exception of maybe Dr. Barnard and Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Furman, many of the doctors in the plant-based world either don't believe in or just kind of don't really know much about food addiction. And you know what you have to realize, Chuck, that all I did was remove animal products from an unhealthy diet. So, so basically I grew up eating animal products and processed food. And when I became vegan, I was just now eating processed food. And, and yes, I understand that these can be transition foods, but I know a lot of people that are the kind of vegan I was that never transition off them. And you cannot live your life, whether you're vegan or not, without eating fruits and vegetables. And that's what I was doing. You know, I'm hosting this GI Health Summit now, and I'm realizing that fiber is like the most important thing in the world for not just gut health, but for all health, and especially where weight loss is concerned. And if you're not eating fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains and legumes, you're not eating any fiber. That's why things like the keto, it, I mean, how did these people even poop? You have to have fiber. <laughs> I, w I was so constipated. I mean, that's why I got the beginning of colon cancer because when you're only pooping like once a week and that's difficult, you know something's wrong. We're supposed to poop like every day. Oh yeah, it's it's funny that you say that. I wasn't vegan, but I did lose a whole lot of weight before I adopted the plant-based diet. But then looking back on what it was that I was eating, more importantly, what it was that I wasn't eating, you know, there there was not as much fiber there as I, you know, there should have been. And man, I'm telling you, like it was coming out like it was a rock and it was not the most <laughs> pleasant experience in the world. But let's not harp on that because it's Monday and we got a whole week to gross people out. Uh, a question for you, going back to the addiction component of it. For me, when I was at my worst, I would go maybe a day or two before like a switch would get flipped and I would become angry and irritable and moody and just basically a really unhappy person to be around because I wasn't getting my food fixed. Was the experience the same for you when you would try to diet? Well, just ask my husband what would happen when I couldn't get my Coke Slurpee. <laughs> I, I was so addicted to sugar and caffeine that I actually moved where I lived so that I could be walking distance to a 7-Eleven because without my fix, I wasn't even able to drive. That's how addicted I was to these substances. And some days I, he was my enabler. I mean, I made him be that because I was so angry that, that he would sometimes have to get me my fix. I, it kind of reminds me of that show, My 600 Pound Life, when I think, how are these people 800 pounds in bed? Somebody's getting them their, their stuff. And when I'd go to 7-Eleven, if they were out of Coke Slurpee, sometimes the machine broke, I would get enraged and I would like yell at the cashier and be calling corporate office like, how dare you be out of, Co you know, I, 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 I mean, when I look back now, I mean, that's, that's, that's crazy, right? And I wasn't just having the Coke Slurpee, I was taking this thing called vanilla syrup and I was like pumping, pumping pumping, pumping. I, I was run, I was running on sugar and, and when I think about it, I, I did a, a, a nutritional analysis recently of how many calories I was getting just from soda when I was eating this way. It was like 1500 calories was from either Coke Slurpees or Dr. Pepper. That's like about how many calories I need in a day now. And I, and I was getting that just from that. And I know when I listen to your story, you kind of were into the Taco Bell and the fast food. Well, I, I was into all the desserts, you know, candies, cakes, cookies, pies, ice cream, as long as they were vegan. And, and, and <laughs> That just that's not the way to go. And then I became a pastry chef, which is like having a fox guard a hen hound, you know. So I, I, I got a hen house.
<laughs> oh, but, I mean, I yeah, I, I, I feel you. I feel you. I mean, I was listening to you. I was like, man, that Coke Slurpee sounds an awful lot like Taco Bell to me. Um, that, that was just my experience. But here's the thing. I want to talk to you about what you call the truth, the secrets about weight loss, because when people think that it's time to go on a diet and to lose weight, they have to severely restrict the amount of food that they're eating. And you kind of already just pinpointed it with fiber. But the truth of this is, and and one of the things that you love to talk about is nothing could be further from the truth. Exactly. And, you know, I learned all of this from, well, actually three people, and they all were in Santa Rosa, Dr. John McDougall, Dr. Doug Lyle, and Dr. Alan Goldhammer. And basically, in two words, if you had to give the secret to weight loss, it's calorie density. And what people don't understand, and Dr. Lyle has been saying this for years, is people are not overweight because they eat too much food. They're overweight because they eat too many calories, because they don't understand calorie density. And when you understand calorie density, you can literally eat twice as much food as you're eating now, yet take in half as many calories. So you don't have to restrict. And these diets that cause you to restrict your food, weigh and measure your food, count calories, carbs, and points, they will be effective for weight loss in the short term. But I don't know very many people that can maintain that kind of eating style in the long term. And when you understand calorie density and simply change the average calorie density of the type of foods you're eating, say by as little as 500 calories per pound, you can safely, sustainably, deliciously eat a a pound, lose about a pound of fat per week. And for a lot of people, that's not fast enough. They want a quick fix, but that's not really the answer. You know, Dr. Dean Ornish wrote about this many years ago in his best-selling book, Eat More, Way Less. And when you understand that foods vary in cal- caloric density from about 100 calories per pound on one end of the spectrum, which is vegetables, raw vegetables, to 4,000 calories per pound on the other end, which is processed oils, you'll see that there's a 40-fold difference in the caloric density of foods. And simply by eliminating oil, which nobody needs for health or for recipes. I mean, right there, you, you, you're saving so many calories just by not using oil. It's just ridiculous. I mean, making that small change, my husband who was already lean, when I took oil out of the diet in August 1st, 2008, and I did this mainly for health reasons after hearing Dr. Esselstyn speak, he was already lean. He didn't know what I was doing because oil doesn't really make a difference to the recipe. In, in like seven months, he had lost nine pounds. And that was the only, like, he, he didn't even know. It's so calorically dense. It doesn't have any nutrients. It doesn't activate the stretch nutrient or calorie receptors. But people that aren't familiar with the concept of food addiction don't understand that the reason we like these high fat, high calorie foods is because they stimulate more production of dopamine in the brain. And we actually become addicted to this artificial stimulation of dopamine. So it's hard for people to let go of these foods, even though in and of itself, oil does not taste very good. People don't sit around drinking oil. Actually, when you use oil, you have to use much more salt. But because it's so calorically dense, you know, we we get a a bigger buzz from it than steamed kale. But really understanding food addiction and calorie density and combining them, it really was the key to the kingdom for me because it it didn't matter uh, how much I ate or when I ate or even why I ate. It just mattered what I ate. When I switched from what I call the right of the red line foods, like all the peanut butter and the Ezekiel bread and any of the vegan desserts or restaurant eating too, a diet of whole natural food, which is what our ancestors ate and which what they eat in many parts of the world today, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. I mean, the weight literally fell off and it's never come back. So I'm I'm just the happiest camper since gaining this information about eight years ago. I I, like, you are a happy camper. I mean, that's just like, you can't hide it. Like that is just who you are. Like you are this happy camper and I love it so much. Um, I want to ask you, you know, the the people who you give advice to, the people who you work with, um, who are concerned that they will never, ever, ever be able to possibly do this because they won't be able to have that Coke Slurpee. They won't be able to go through the drive-through. How, you know, how does the satiety effect of that plant-based diet, having that caloric density, you know, there, making sure that you can still have that stomach nice and full and, you know, not be hungry and go without, how does that play into weaning somebody off of the foods that they're addicted to? <laughs> that's, 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 doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And I think, you know, because I believe you had the, the surgery that, that surgery you had is, is the same principle of caloric density. If you think about it, right, because it, it, they made your stomach smaller, so you'd feel full faster. So what I like to teach people is if before you do that, instead of making your stomach smaller, let's make the food bigger. And this is the idea that Dr. Barbara Rolls talks about in her books, Volumetrics. So we're eating larger quantities of food that are more calorically dilute, but more nutrient dense. And so they activate 
sooner your stretch nutrient and calorie receptors. Now that addictive piece, that doesn't mean that that's going to go away right away. And I don't think people should tell themselves that I can never have a Coke Slurpee or whatever their Coke Slurpee is again, because what happens is, is they'll kick over the table and say, well, I'm not going to do this. It's sort of like, like with alcoholism or drug addiction, you don't say forever, you do it a day at a time. And that's why I love the idea of the, the PCRM 21 day kickstart, because even most people can do things for 21 days if they really commit to it. People have been historically for years celebrating a holiday call Lent where they give something up like coffee or alcohol or chocolate. And so I think most people can commit to smaller uh, chunks of time. But to, to tell yourself, I'm never going to have this again, you probably will fail because, you know, like they like Dr. Jen Hawk says, relapse is part of recovery. You're not going to never have it again. You're just going to not have it at the next meal and then the next meal and the next meal. The hope is and the goal is, is that when you really neuroadapt and get used to these less stimulating foods that produce less dopamine and maybe do other things in your life that give you pleasure, like maybe start exercising or doing volunteer work or doing some kind of something that's meaningful for you. You require less stimulation from all these processed foods and how long it takes. It's just, it, everybody's different. There are people, you know, I've seen it, it takes them a week and there's people I've like four months till this food starts tasting good, but you really are meant you're designed to like, not just like, but to love the taste of whole natural foods, beans and rice and sweet potatoes. And once you start eliminating that junk, you really start tasting this food and can appreciate it. But the longer you've been abusing the, the, the drug of processed food, the longer it might take. And also most people are not living in a bubble. They're often socializing with people that are still using and abusing these foods, living in households with family members that don't not only don't want to be vegan, but certainly don't want to give up the crap. So that social aspect I find is the biggest problem because when people go to the McDougal 10 day program or go to the True North Health Center, it's not a problem. They fast or they do the program and in you know 10 days, they're looking good, their numbers are great, and the food is tasting great, but then they go back into the environment or everybody else is an addict. And it, it, it is very hard. And I think everybody's an addict to some degree or another. It just affects people's health differently. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you think about it, you know, so many people can't go without that cup of coffee. So many people can't go without that little piece of chocolate every day, whatever the case may be. Everybody has that little something, something. But you mentioned 10 day programs, you mentioned 21 day programs, but you have a two week program that you're running. Talk to me a little well, bit. About well, it's that. actually, it's, the program is not two weeks. I wish it could only be two weeks, but I, I have this group called Feel Fabulous Over 40. You don't have to be over 40. You don't even have to be female. But I run it and it's it's just it's for support, it's recipes, it's got just a lot of bells and whistles. And and so we we offer it to people for two weeks for free just to see if it's right for them. And if it is, then they can join. And if not, and we do a lot of group interactions and live success stories. And we have like doctors like Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Frank Sabatino that come on once a month and answer questions. And it's just, you know, we created a nice little community because not everybody has the support that they need at home or in their real life. And and so I, what's really inspiring is that once a month we do success stories and it, we show that it doesn't matter how long or how deeply you've suffered. When I interview people, they're not just people in their 20s and 30s. There's 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And now we have an 80 year old. Uh, the 90 year old that I work with unfortunately passed away after nine years. She started with me at 90. But that it doesn't really matter your age. That once you get this information and you implement it, I really do believe that success can be yours. And I just think that having a supportive community when the rest of the world is is eating differently can make a difference to a lot of people, especially people that are more uh, as social and more extroverted. Hey, if you're an introvert, you can probably do this yourself at home without anybody's help. But a lot of people need people to lift them up and to and to be there when they fall. And and everybody's going to fall. Just you know, people say, "Oh, Shabaju, you're so perfect." Okay, so I'm not perfect. Probably the only perfect person in this arena would be Dr. Ellen Goldhammer, and I'm not so sure he's perfect either. He just appears that way. I'm not perfect, but what I do have is a perfect environment. And what I mean by that is what separates me from a lot of people that have not yet had success is that once I learned this information about how the environment was critical to your success from recovering from addiction, I don't let a morsel, a drop, a crumb of food that is not on my plant in the house. And it doesn't matter who comes here. It's just not allowed. Just like an alcoholic might say, hey, you're not bringing alcohol in my house. Wait, you're not bringing vegan junk food or any junk food into my house. So that's one non-negotiable that I've had since I learned this information. And then the only thing other do that I might do you know, perfectly, or I do very well, is I batch cook. And so there's always healthy food to eat. So it, it's just very easy for me because there's always delicious, healthy food. And 
that's really the secret to my success, the clean environment that's filled always with lots of delicious sweet potatoes that are already baked and, and salads that are already chopped and dressings that are already made and watermelons that are already cut up. It's just very easy. When I'm hungry, I open the fridge and there's there's the food. And that really has been the two secrets and that I'd like everybody to adopt because it really makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I love that. Not a crumb, not a drop approach. I think that that's so critical for the reasons that you just said. You wouldn't give an alcoholic a drink after so many years and say, hey, you can have just one. No way. It just does not work like that. But with the hardline approach that you take about not even allowing somebody to bring it into your house, how did that affect initially your social circles? Did you lose some friends? And I did. I'm I sure lost, you were able I, to replenish. I did, but I got better friends, actually. I remember, I'm not going to say the gentleman's name, but I did lose one friend because when I explained to him that I suffer from a food addiction and so I couldn't go to this vegan restaurant with him anymore because it was very triggering the pizzas and the lasagnas and all the, the the cakes and stuff and and he and I said and I actually sent him a list of a hundred things we could do from going to a animal sanctuary to volunteering to going hiking bowling yoga he goes well if we can't go to restaurants I don't want to be your friend but is that really a friend is if somebody that shares your if somebody that is only there to share your addiction that's not a friend that's a that's a co-addict that's a that's an enabler. So you get better friends. And I understand that it can be difficult socially. But you know, I think because I had parents that, that we were raised kosher, and because we had that non negotiable line, people didn't bring non kosher food in the house, it doesn't matter who they were. So I had that kind of strength of character knowing just like as a vegan, look, I, if, as a vegan, I'm not gonna let people ever bring animal products in my house. So what so it wasn't that hard for me. Also, I'm a little bit more of a disagreeable personality than a lot of women. So it, it, it can be difficult. But you know, my recovery, is the most important thing to me. And if I'm not, if I'm not in a state of recovery, I can't help anybody. And so I, I do draw a hard line. A lot of people say I'm too extreme, but am I really? Because for addiction, I don't know that moderation has ever worked. And when you really see food as an addiction, I think it's much easier to recover. Once somebody explained to me that was the problem, I was like, really? Oh, so all I have to do is stop eating sugar and flour and these really high fat triggering foods like peanut butter and I'll get well. And she goes, yeah, I'm like, oh gosh. Nobody told me that. I, I thought I had to eat nuts. Like this was great, but but that's the thing. Addicts don't like moderation. You know, you know, smokers don't want to cut down the number of cigarettes or stop smoking. Not really. Not until something maybe major happens. And even then, like when they get lung cancer, you know, it, it's almost like the idea of a smoker getting lung cancer. And instead of quitting smoking, he says to the doctor or she says to the doctor, "Okay, all right, I got this lung cancer. Now, what kind of cigarettes can I continue to smoke, and how many?" No. Done. You know, and, and I, I think about Dr. Goldhammer saying, if you could have controlled it, you would have controlled it. If you could have been moderate with the amount of X, Y, Z, you wouldn't have been overweight and had a lifestyle disease. So what makes you think you can control it now just by weighing and measuring it or having it on Sundays? I think cheat days are the stupidest thing in the whole world because who are you cheating? Your body's never not looking. So abstinence isn't for everyone. I get it. But for those of us who have embraced it, it is pure bliss. Go, girl. I mean, just keep on going. Don't get off that soapbox. Please. I know this is I, because I feel so good. And I, you know, I'm 60 years old. I think I look better than I've ever looked. I love, I mean, I remember, you know, I, it's funny. I was before you, I was interviewed for a podcast and I remember being a, a, a little girl and I remember it was second or third grade and being so fat that the sales lady said that if I gained any more weight, I'd have to shop at Lane Giants. She was calling it Lane Giants. She meant Lane Bryant's, but she was doing a real dig to me. And I wasn't even in the fourth grade then, right? Because I was so fat that young that I was at the like the top women's size already. And to like now just be able to buy clothes like anywhere and, and wear cute clothes, you know, people, somebody sent me this and it's an extra small. And it's like, I don't mean to be bragging. It's just that I was obese for 52 years and it's fun tonight, finally be able to wear nice clothes. And it's just, I just, I don't think about food anymore, but see, that's the best thing. What people don't understand, it's not just about the weight. I didn't ever expect to get this thin because when I took my first 20 pounds off, I was, I still looked pretty good. I remember running into Brian Wendell at an animal rights fundraiser. I had gotten down from a size 16 to a 10 and, and I looked fine. I was not even obese then. He says, wow, you look great. And I'm like, okay, I figured this was it. I didn't know I was going to lose, you know, another, I don't know, like 20, 25 pounds, but my brain, I felt so calm not being in the pleasure trap and thinking about when my next 
next fix was, which is what all I used to do. That's what we do as addicts. We go to bed thinking about the next day. We wake up thinking, when are we going to have this? And when's the next hit? And when's the next hit? I think about food at the appropriate times when I'm hungry. And since my refrigerator is always stocked with healthy food, it's just a matter of, you know, do I take the lemon poppy seed dressing or do I take the strawberry fiesta dressing? There's not a lot of decisions to make. Do I take the Japanese sweet potato or do I take the Hannah yam? I'm going to have Brussels sprouts or broccoli. Very little decision making because because when you when you have to make decisions, you deplete your willpower. I never have to use willpower because I never have to fight against eating something that's not there. And that is the secret. And and I tell all this stuff freely on all my talks. It's just that it's difficult for people to do because I think the social piece gets in the way because, oh, what do my friends think? What do my family think? Oh, I can never have another piece. Yeah. You know, it's a trade off. I maybe can. And I don't actually I don't tell myself I can never have that because the truth is, if you offered me ten thousand dollars to eat a vegan cookie, I'm taking it. And I think I would get back right on track. So I don't tell myself I can never have that. Dr. Goldhammer said that I could have it in 50 years. And I started with him when I was 50. So when I'm 100, I'll have a Coke Slurpee if I want one. I just interviewed Elaine Lelane, who's 94 years old, and they didn't eat any processed food, her and Jack. He, he was vegetarian. I don't think she was. But the point was they didn't eat any of this addictive processed food. And, and when she turned 80, she told me, she said to Jack, well, you know, if somebody offers me a piece of birthday cake on my birthday, I think I'm going to take it now after, after not eating that stuff forever. So it doesn't mean it's forever, but man, you feel so good off the drug. Why do you want to go back on it? People have not been off it long enough to know how good they can feel because it's so hard to get off. And, and it's, I, I wish it was easier, but it's not, but you know, anything worthwhile is going to be difficult at first, but the people that have crossed to the other side, like me, like you, and some of the people we've worked with, you feel so much better off the drug than you ever did on the drug. You just can't see that when you're caught in the throes of addiction. The freedom from food addiction feels much better than any of those foods ever felt. I promise you 100%, but you have to get there. And that could be a difficult road for some people. Now I'm going to talk directly to the guests who will be on the show for the rest of the week. Just, just give me a second. Y'all need to step up your game. Because good luck topping what just happened here on the show today. Chef AJ, this is this is just amazing. Uh, I mean, seriously, you you are my hero. Mm -hmm. You get it. You are inspiring. You are helping people. You are everything that this world needs and more. And for that, we are grateful. So if people want to uh, learn more about you and get on board the the book, the secret, the secrets to ultimate weight loss. I love the way that you put that. The secrets to ultimate weight loss. That's available on Amazon now. We're going to drop a link to that in the show notes. And I understand you have a newsletter as well. Yeah. So my my name, my website's my name, Chef AJ website, and we don't really sell much, we if anything, but uh, we we tell you who's going to be on the show. So like you, I have a daily show. It's seven days a week at eleven a.m. Pacific time, and I interview amazing people like you and Dr. Barnard. Dr. Bernard's already been on. You're going to be on very soon. And people who you may not have heard of, because I'm really trying to get people to know some of the other people that are doing great things in the plant-based world as well. So that's been my passion. Now I can see why you love doing this so much, because you meet the most incredible people. And so if you sign up for my newsletter, we'll just tell you who's on the show. So therefore, you can write in questions in advance. And I host a couple of summits, one that you're going to be a guest on called The Truth About Weight Loss. And so I love the summits because we can really dive deep for an hour with each expert. And I'll tell you, just watching that summit, you could get all, everything you need to know how to lose weight. And it's completely free. It'll air February of 2021. And of course, Dr. Barnard will be a guest as well. So we, we get some great people. But I love interviewing people even more than I like being interviewed. Oh, it's great, isn't it? I, I mean, really, because you do, you get to meet the most fascinating people. And, and, and there's a little bit of every story that really sticks with you and you can identify with. And then there are the other aspects that you're like, man that's like really freaking impressive. Like how great is that? And then when you think that that story can't be topped, here's another person with more inspiration. And then you just pile on the different layers of inspiration. And before you know it, man, changing the world. And that is exactly what it is that you are doing, Chef. AJ, you are amazing. You are my hero. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Chef AJ, we will talk to you again soon. Can't wait to be on your program as well. So uh, everybody go pick up the book. That link is in the uh, show notes or the comment section as it were right now. Now also coming up this week is the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine that starts on Thursday, runs through Saturday. For the first time ever, this thing is completely online and 
for the first time ever, exclusive for exam room viewers. We are offering a 20% off for registration. All you need to do is use the promo code exam and then the number 20 when you register, lowercase exam and the number 20 when you register to get 20% off. Go to pcrm.org slash ICNM to register today. Now, check this out. Here's here's who's going to be talking, right? We've got Dr. Neil Barnard. He will be there. He's going to be teaming up with Dr. Christy Cobb. The two of them will be talking about nutrition and sex hormones. And then we've got Dr. Shivam Josie. He was on the exam room podcast not too terribly long ago, talking about the latest research on plant-based diets and kidney disease. Fascinating connection there. Dr. Vanita Ramaz, she will be there talking about nutrition and hypertension, especially critical right now in this current pandemic when we see how much high blood pressure can affect your risk of having COVID-19. Uh, also, and, and I love this one, right? Doctors Walter Willett and David Katz, they're gonna be teaming up on day two. They're gonna be giving a talk called What's Behind Nutrition Controversies? Making Sense of the Science, right? Making Sense of the Science. How great is that? All of that, so many others, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, everybody will be there, Dr. Kim Williams. So head over to pcrm.org slash ICNM and use that promo code EXAM20 to save 20% off registration. And that gets underway this Thursday. And we can't wrap up today's show also without revisiting some exciting news. And that is that the doctors and dietitians from the Barnard Medical Center, they are now available to take appointments with people who live in Illinois, in Indiana, and Pennsylvania. So three brand new states, and that comes right on the heels of the additions of Florida and Georgia to the roster. So that's very exciting. The Barnard Medical Center now available in more than a quarter of the country. The other states, uh, California, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Kentucky. I feel like I should know all of these by heart now. But all of those states are available right now for so head over to barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone, call 202-527-7500. Really nothing to lose and only your health to gain. And even if you think, hey, I'm already healthy. I've got this whole plant-based thing down to a science. No, no. You can meet with them and take your level to a whole new game. Like this is really next level nutrition science that they're going to be using their preventative medicine at its finest, barnardmedical.org, 202-527-7500. Now, as we spoke about earlier today, coming up tomorrow on the show, we will be joined by Dr. Hanna Kaliova. She will be examining a brand new study that looks at why obesity is so common among COVID-19 patients. Going to be some really interesting discussion and some fascinating research that we will be diving into right back here on Facebook and YouTube at noon Eastern. But for today, that is all the time that we have. My thanks again to Chef AJ for inspiring us today and to the people behind the scenes that make the magic happen. Our director is Donna Steele and our producer is Laura Anderson. On behalf of Dr. Neil Barnard and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks for tuning in today. And until tomorrow, please remember to stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.